Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to uh, our solar thermal uh, class. Uh, I'm going to go through uh, chapter 3 with you uh, in this video recording. Um, uh, once again, my name is Emmanuel Ramdi, and I'm giving this lecture with my colleague in Ouagadougou, uh, Dr. Yao Azuma. Uh, this chapter is... Uh, based mainly on the applications of uh, low temperature solar thermal uh, power. And the applications uh, are mainly solar water heating, solar drying, and solar cooking. Uh, solar cooling could be part, but we devoted a full chapter for solar cooling. So the learning objectives for this chapter are number one, to know the main applications of low temperature solar thermal power. And number two, to understand how solar water heating, solar drying and solar uh, cooking work. Uh, the chapter content is as simple as that. Solar water heating, first point. Second point, solar drying, and the third point, the last one, solar cooking. Solar water heating. Um, basically, you have two types of solar water heating. You have the active solar water heaters that use mechanical device to force the circulation of the fluid. And you have the passive solar water heaters. There is no mechanical device. It's just natural convection. And when you talk about natural convection, what is it? So, uh, natural convection is caused by difference in density. And the difference in density is caused by a temperature gradient. Let's look at the example here. Or uh, Before that, let's define what is density. Density is mass over volume. And uh, because volume expands, Many of the fluids, the volume expands when they are being heated up. So as temperature goes up, okay, so the volume goes up. The consequence of that is that the density will come down. So as temperature goes up, volume goes up, consequence density will come down. So the fluids that are in contact with the heat source, you look at the picture here, their density will be lowered. And the fluids that are far away from the heat source, they remain, their density remain heavier than those close to the heat source. Consequence, the density difference will cause a natural circulation. The warmer fluid will tend to rise and the cooler fluid will tend to fall down by gravity, creating some currents. So we have all noticed, we have all in one point in time in our life heated water. And uh, you could see that when you start heating the water, uh, before it boils, 
you see some current water moving inside. So that's natural convection. Natural convection takes place when there is no mechanical device used to circulate the fluid. Assuming here in this situation you take a spoon and you start steering the water inside the, the, the pan. So in that case it's no longer natural convection. But it's a false convection because you are using the mechanical device, in this case a spoon, to force the circulation of the water. So likewise in a in a room so if you have a heater in the room the air in the room closer to the heat source the heater will heat up their density will be low consequently they tend to rise but the cooler air which is quite far from the heat source having a much higher density we tend to fall down so you will have a current air current inside the room this air current takes place whenever you have a heat source a heater in the room or you have an air conditioner in the room air is not visible so you wouldn't see the, 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 the current if you want to see the current you may need to color the, the air and you will see the current of air inside the room so uh, natural convection heat uh, solar water heaters are called passive solar water heaters and the term passive and active are not only used in solar water heating they are used in solar drying they are used in solar cooling they are used in solar building heating they are used in many other areas so you understand the principle here and it works elsewhere whenever the word passive and active are used good so these pictures are showing active solar water heaters the left hand side shows an indirect circulation and the right hand side shows a direct circulation what is the difference the left hand side picture they are all active uh, the both pictures they are all active uh, uh, solar water heaters because they use pumps to circulate the water on the left hand side you see the pump here where the cursor is on the right hand side you see the pump here okay so they are all active solar water heaters now one is indirect and the other is direct in the indirect solar water heaters you have two loops or let's say two fluids you have the first fluid going through the solar collector and it is a closed loop it's not open that fluid can be there for years no need to top up as long as there is no leakage it's a closed loop so that fluid goes to the collector picks up the heat and comes back and releases the heat into the the storage medium this is the storage medium through this coil which serves as a heat exchanger therefore the second loop is made up of uh, the water loop because this very fluid here may not be water and I'll explain to you why it shouldn't even be water in temperate climates it shouldn't be water simply because during the winter 
during the night the collector cools down and the fluid in the pipe will then freeze and you know that water is one of the very rare fluids that expands when they freeze so water will then expand and it can burst the piping and spoil the collector in cold climates they rather use a mixture of glycol and water and glycol doesn't uh, uh, freeze very easily the freezing temperature is very low so that's why we have this loop here and then you have your water loop so the water loop the cold water comes in in the storage tank picks up the heat and then you use it outside and uh, with a mixer you can mix up the cold water and the warm water and, and get it and if you are not satisfied because of there is uh, there was a cloudy day uh, there was a raining day and the solar didn't perform well you have an auxiliary heater it could be gas it could be electrical okay so the auxiliary heater comes to uh, a sort of rescue to the solar water heater when there is no sun so this is the in indirect circulation so where you have a first loop made up of uh, another fluid different from the water loop fluid and then on the right picture you have the direct circulation where cold water comes in it mixes up with uh, the the warm water in in the uh, in the in the water tank okay and it's being pumped into the collector picks up the heat and comes back remember that all the blue lines are cold water the red lines are warm water good another active but indirect circulation solar water heater is the drain back solar water heater uh, the left hand side is when there is sun so it is working right the right hand side is when the system is not working it shut down okay so the a H is always the auxiliary heater you can take it off if you think you have enough sun or days you can take it off and um, here why is there any need of having this so instead of having um, an antifreeze an antifreeze fluid in the solar loop like here this is an antifreeze uh, fluid and I've explained to you during the night if you have a fluid that freezes it will freeze because there is no sun and it can be dangerous for the piping so to avoid that you make a system whereby when the system is not working all the fluid drains back into a sort of reservoir so on the left hand side it is working the pump pumps the fluid okay and it comes it pours down here and as soon as the pump stops by gravity all the fluid inside the collector will drain down into the reservoir so it is then safe in very cold climate you don't have your collector with the fluid inside freezing and then 
causing problems, failure. So basically, how that's how it works. For passive solar water heaters, you have basically two types. You have the thermosiphon, and you have the integral collector storage system. The integral collector storage system is very simple, very very simple. So you have a storage tank and you have um, a flat plate uh, collector, a box, glass cover, and you have the tank inside, okay, the box. So with the green, greenhouse gas effect, greenhouse effect, so the, the heat will be trapped inside the box, heating up the, the water inside the, the storage tank, and then you can you can get your outlet water uh, naturally okay because the warmer fluid uh, we, we come to top and the cooler fluid will be down there okay. and then you have the thermosiphon the thermosiphon is also based on the natural convection difference in densities due to temperature gradient and then some natural circulation so it's being applied here so you have the tank containing water the bottom is bluish so it's cold water and uh, it drops down by gravity it drops down by gravity and goes to the collector the collector is inclined. What is going on? The collector is warm and once the water, the cold water gets in touch with the collector, it starts warming up. And as it warms up, it tends to be rising by natural convection and goes to the top of the, the tank. So if you need warm water, you can then uh, tap it from the top, not the down. <laughs> the down you get cold water, so you tap it from the top. And this works very well in very sunny zones, very sunny climates, uh, northern Ghana, uh, getting to Burkina, Niger, Mali, uh, thermosiphons water heaters work very well they work very well one important thing i must say is that you see uh, countries have their own regulations and regulations are based on this on that you know uh, reasons and uh, in germany for instance thermosiphons or natural convection on passive solar water heaters are not allowed by the law. The law does not allow passive solar water heaters. The number one reason is that they think that uh, the passive solar water heaters may not provide enough hot water. And there is this disease called Legionnaire disease. It's from French, Legionellose. Uh, the Legionnaire disease is a disease, uh, is a f form of a bacteria that forms into stagnant water. And that stagnant water, uh, uh, if the temperature in is between uh, uh, some range, I think up to 40 degrees Celsius, it is very favorable for these bacteria to, 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 to develop. So to avoid that, in Germany, all water heaters, whether solar water heaters, electric water heaters, they have to heat up the water beyond the 40 degrees Celsius to kill that bacteria. So the law says that oh, the risk involved in having um, temperatures, water temperatures below 40 is high with passive solar water heaters. 
So we will not allow them. So all water heaters should be active. Okay, we don't want thermosiphons, and uh, they should even include an auxiliary heater to make sure that the water comes out above the 40, 45 degrees Celsius, free of any bacteria. So this, for instance, is very an important information that you you should know. <coughs> So we move to solar drying. What is the working principle behind solar dryers? Much like natural convection we explained uh, is based on you know uh, difference in density, core buoyancy. Uh, here, uh, solar dryers work on the principle of relative humidity. What is relative humidity? Relative humidity defines the amount of moisture or the amount of water vapor in the air compared to what the air can hold at that temperature. If, for instance, I say the relative humidity in Kigali is 60 degrees Celsius, uh, the relative humidity is 60 percent at 25 degrees Celsius in Kigali. Just an example. What does it mean? It means that uh, the air in Kigali can still hold 40 percent of water vapor. That's the meaning. If in Kumasi, in Ghana, the relative humidity is 90%. It means there is only room for water vapor, only 10%. If in Lagos, there is 98% relative humidity, it means the air is almost saturated. 98%, it remains 2%. 100%, it means the air is completely saturated. It cannot, it can, it can no longer take up any water vapor. So, meaning that if it is 100% in Lagos, and you wash your clothes and you put them in the drying line, uh, I'm sorry, but uh, they will not dry because the air is already saturated. So, relative humidity is what is being used in solar drying. I will explain. So, um, relative humidity goes down when the temperature goes up. So if for instance at 10 degrees Celsius the air is already saturated and you heat up that air to 20 degrees Celsius is an example the humidity, the relative humidity can drop to 52%. And if you continue heating up to 30 degrees Celsius, the relative humidity can even drop to 28%. Meaning that if you have a saturated water, uh, saturated air, and uh, you want to use it to dry your clothes or you want to dry, use it to dry uh, some crops, what all you need to do is to heat up the air so that you lower the relative humidity before you allow that air to enter the drying chamber. In summary, the solar collector here, number one, is to heat up the air and then lower the relative humidity. 
and low relative humidity means more potential to take up moisture so once you lower it you channel it into the drying chamber and it will pick up the moisture from the crop and then exit that's the working principle behind solar dryers now you have many types of solar dryers they are based on uh, you know uh, the fact that uh, uh, you could have uh, uh, passive dryers or active dryers whether you are using a mechanical device a fan or a blower to force the air into the drying chamber etc so the passive dryers will use fans blowers to force the air into the drying chamber while the active the passive dryers will not use any mechanical device it's just natural convection good now depending on if the drying chamber is transparent or not you have what we call direct or indirect so this is where the case is on the picture is a direct type so you have the solar radiation falling onto the drying chamber and uh, it means that the drying chamber is transparent so this is an indirect type you have the solar collector right and then you have the drying chamber which is opaque to any solar radiation you may have reasons for having this type of dryer there are some agricultural produce like moringa moringa leaves it seems when uh, the solar radiation hits them they lose some of the nutrients so you may have reasons if you want to dry moringa to make sure that the drying chamber is opaque to solar radiation it's only the collector that will receive the solar radiation heats up the air lowering its humidity ratio and sending it to the drying chamber to dry your produce so depending on whether it is active passive direct indirect or you can even have a mixed mode so the mixed mode uh, the drying chamber is transparent okay and then you also have the air being channeled through the the collector so it's mixed okay so when you have the fan is active you see a fan here fan here a fan here okay it's active dryers here you have nothing no mechanical device okay so it's just passive dryers natural convection dryers so now when it comes to solar cookers solar cookers there is nothing to explain about it you have the heat and then you use the heat to cook your food the heat could be gas, could be electricity, uh, and here it is the sun energy. So you have many configurations. So for instance, this is a simple box. It is called solar box cooker. So, and uh, it works like a, a flat plate collector. So you have the glass covering the box and inside you put your whatever you want to cook okay and then um, it heats up it warms up inside that's all when uh, you want to come and open it uh, and uh, very simple anyone can have one in his house it's very simple good and then you have the parabolic cooker 
a parabolic cooker uses a parabolic dish. And the parabolic dish is uh, formed with mirrors. So the mirrors are shaped in a parabolic form. And you know parabolic dishes or parabolic mirrors have what we call a focal point. A little bit of optics. So all sun radiation falling into the mirrors are being reflected into their focal points. So consequence, the focal point will be very, very hot. So that's where you put your cooking pot and get your food cooked. So these are the, the, the parabolic cookers. So uh, you need to be rotating it uh, in order for it to follow the sun from morning to evening or during your cooking time. It has to follow the sun. Because here, uh, it does not use the diffuse radiation. Remember that the diffuse radiation comes from all the directions, therefore cannot be concentrated, cannot be reflected or concentrated. So it's only the beam part that you need to, to focus. And the beam part, uh, you need to, to rotate to track the sun, okay? Otherwise, you'll miss it. Good. We have another example that is a solar butterfly cooker. The butterfly cooker is just an improvement of the solar parabolic cooker. You could see that uh, it's almost a parabolic, uh, but it cuts in some part so that uh, uh, the one operating it a person operating it can come inside. Here you have to stand from far away and, and put your hand and pick whatever you want to pick. But here you can come inside. And this also has the advantage that it can be folded. Once you finish cooking, you can fold it and take it inside and put. But this one is, occupies space. It cannot be folded. Good. We have the Scheffler cooker, which is again, uh, here is a sort of uh, uh, mirror, parabolic mirror or a, a flat mirror that uh, focuses the sun radiation into its focal point. So you make sure there is a secondary reflector. Here, for instance, you see that there is a window that serves as the secondary reflector. So the sun radiation heats up the secondary reflector. And the secondary reflector reflects it into your cooking stuff. It's called the Scheffler cooker, uh, named after its inventor, Scheffler. Now, you have flat plate collector cookers, as simple as uh, flat plate uh, solar dryer. You have the, the collector, okay? And then you have uh, some oil with the storage, okay? And then the oil is being heated up in the collector and taken back to the storage. So the storage is always warm. And then uh, you have your pot that you can just, you know, uh, sort of put inside the oil and you get your stuff cooked. So um, 